Bushnell's hands were tied by the government's policy of non-intervention. So when she called extremist Hutu leaders, she could threaten them only with words. Um, I would set the alarm for two o'clock in the morning and having these bizarre conversations in French. Hello, this is our Prudence Bush now. Stop it. Stop killing people. When she called General Kagame, the Tutsi rebel leader, Bushnell's instructions were to demand that he halt his advance and negotiate with the extremists. He w was always very dispassionate, but there was a burst in the middle of this conversation of a fair amount of passion when he said to me, Madam, they're killing my people. And it wasn't part of my instructions to be empathetic to, um, and yet it was, it really pulled at my heart because um, I knew they were killing his people. And uh, indeed I talked to Pru Bushner and I hit remembering the conversation I had with her because uh, it always brings back those memories that while for us we are focusing on and seeing that hundreds of thousands of people were being killed. Somebody else was talking about something else that had nothing to do with saving the lives of these people who are being killed. Uh, the only effort I could make as a human being to sort of reach out a hand of humanity um, by saying, as I signed off, General, I wish you peace. And that's the way I ended my conversations with him. Um, it was awful. Excuse me. It was really difficult. As the outside world left Rwanda to its fate, one UN soldier in Kigali was taking matters into his own hands. Captain Mbai Jang of Senegal was an unarmed UN observer, renowned for his ability to charm his way past the killers. He was a tall, tall guy. And he had a smile, a big toothy smile. Even in all this, you know, gore and hatred, as long as you can have that brief glimpse of, you know, a smile or something to laugh about that's good, you grab onto it. And with Mbai, I think that's what everybody did. At all those checkpoints, they all knew him. From the first hours of the genocide, Captain Mbai had ignored orders to remain neutral. He had rescued the children of Prime Minister Ragath, hiding them in a closet while their mother was being killed. Based at the Hotel Milkolin, a safe haven in the center of Kigali, Captain Mbai was part of a group of UN observers whose very presence was often enough to keep the killers at bay. These guys didn't move. This, this heart of, of, of observers, the gang that stayed at the Minkorin, there were seven or eight of them. That particular group, on their own initiative, would go to places where people told there might be people hidden, and they would get them out and bring them to either mid or another safe place that we had. And, and Yang was one of those leaders in that. I mean, he was, was evident, uh, courageous, and risk-taking. But even General Dallaire didn't realize the full extent of Captain Mbai's secret rescue missions. 
we see in this back room in Amahoro Hotel, the headquarters. You know, large groups of people that all of a sudden appeared and then the next day were gone. We began to uh, put together that Mbai was bringing people from all over town to the headquarters and then evacuating them or having them picked up and taken to safety elsewhere. I knew what Mbai Dian was doing. I had a very, very strong uh, suspicion, put it that way, of what he was doing. And had I investigated, I could have found out. I didn't want to find out. I didn't want to say there is a Senegalese officer saving people in this town. You can imagine what the impact of that would have been. He would have been killed. While observers like Captain Mbai were saving hundreds of lives, General Dallaire had a plan to save tens of thousands by creating more safe havens like the few his troops were already protecting in Kigali. Dallaire had a plan um, which was basically to secure football stadiums in every town <coughs> around Rwanda. Football stadiums were particularly de defendable areas because they had large concrete stands. Uh, and uh, if you have 50 soldiers with guns on the top of those stands, you can stop people coming in to kill people, basically. So it was, I think it was very doable if there had been a much uh, bigger UN, not that much bigger, a few, a few thousand well-armed UN soldiers. General, you do say that people are being killed, uh, taken out of fight in Cap Gun. What can the UN do about it? Uh, send me troops. Yeah. Will you send the troops? Well, what more do you want me to say? I'm waiting here. So send me troops. But the UN Security Council was skeptical. Yeah, we knew what Dallaire was saying, but remember, the Belgians, which were the primary Western European force, had left. And there weren't many other European forces that had real capacity raising their hand up in the air, volunteering to put battalions on the ground in Rwanda. It just didn't exist. American officials worried that UN troops would get embroiled in Rwanda's civil war because the Tutsi rebels of the Rwanda Patriotic Front made it clear they would oppose a robust UN force. At the time, the RPF was determined to take Kigali, take power back in Kigali, and they weren't interested in the UN coming back in. They saw a UN force as being a force that would prop up the Hutu regime that was committing the very atrocities that were ongoing. So the RPF was not interested in a UN force, and this was crucial to our decision-making regarding whether a force would go in and whether it would go into Kigali. The UN told Dallaire he would get no more troops. And without a larger force, all he could do was to keep trying to negotiate a ceasefire between the Tutsi rebels and the Hutu government. I was also uh, determined to continue to keep negotiations going because maybe it'll stop. Maybe with the, a ceasefire, you know, between the two belligerents, we might be able to stop the massacre. When the ceasefire talks again went nowhere, Dallaire asked to meet directly with the commanders of the death squads. I had to crack the nut of the militias. And so I asked Bagasora, I said, listen, let me meet these guys. Let me negotiate with them. Inside a Kigali hotel, the leaders of the Interahamwe were waiting. And so when I arrived, uh, Pagasora introduced them. Uh, and as I was looking at them and shaking their hands, uh, I noticed some blood spots still on them. And all of a sudden, they didn't, they disappeared from being human. All of a sudden, something happened that turned them into non-human things. And I was not talking with humans. I literally was talking with evil.
eating became a 